Christ comes up to give the sermon. We're going to read Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Now, Grace, I'm on. Because it talks about his grace. It was written 
to the Ephesians, from, to the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a, a large city. It was a port city. There were thousands of people. It was in Ephesus where Paul preached and he laid his hands on 12 men and they received the Holy Spirit. It was there that he reasoned in the hall of, hall of Tyrannus because the Jews would not listen to him. It was there that they had a great temple of the goddess Artemis. It was a wicked city, but it was a city that God's gospel was shared throughout. So, our first thing that this passage reveals to us, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. It's important that we understand grace, but before we can understand the depth of God's grace, we need to know where we start. Why do we need grace? Why do we need God's unmerited favor? And this passage reveals to us who we are. You are dead. When you're dead, there's not much you can do to help your situation. You can't think, you can't smell, you can't taste. You're dead. We were dead. So we were dead. We followed the course of the world. Like the days of Noah, we followed the world. The world is in rebellion to God. More than that, each one of us followed the prince of the power of the air, which is the devil. We were followers of the devil because of our sin. We follow the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Our report card does not look good. Because who we are as human beings is an enemy of God. Because God is holy. He created the world perfect. And then by our sin, we've rebelled and we follow the devil in the world. And so, it says we are by nature, our very nature, we are objects of God's wrath. We are children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Our greed, we work for ourselves. Our pride, we don't rely on God. We don't admit our failure. We're selfish with our families. We hate one another. God is righteous and just. Like a judge who does not tolerate wrongdoing. If I were to go kill someone, someone should bring me to justice. And hopefully, the law would bring me to justice. But when we die, the Lord will also bring us to justice. We will have to give account for everything done in the flesh, whether good or bad. But he will surely punish us for our sins. Now I kind of want to clarify this because maybe you've heard this before. And a thought that I had growing up is, how does that make sense? That my sin deserves wrath. That my sin deserves for me to be thrown into hell and tormented forever. That doesn't make sense. Like if I still a lollipop? Crime doesn't seem worthy of punishment, but when we look at who Christ is and who we've sinned against, it makes a little more sense. Whoever the nature of who you commit the crime against increases the wrath. If I were to, this analogy is from a documentary called The American Gospel. I suggest you, it's a really good one. But if I take this tape, 
and I stole from my sister in law. Somebody who got the Christmas tree. If I were to scratch it with a knife or something, it would be like, why did, Tess would say, why did you scratch it on a piece of tape? You shouldn't have done that. You no, know, it's not a big deal though. If I were to go to a used car parking lot and scratch one of those cars, now I'm a public defender. I did the same thing, but because I did it to a car, there's more punishment because of it. God, God is like a Lamborghini. You scratch a Lamborghini with a knife, and you will have punishment. God is our maker and He's our creator. It's like if I say something offensive to my father, if I say to my dad, I wish you were dead and so I could have all your foilers or something like that. <laughs> then, that's serious. Or my mom. My mom gave me birth. We are worthy of His wrath. And God is righteous and right when He pours His wrath upon us. Like the flood, the earth that all of mankind, except for those who God had mercy and grace upon, they were wiped out because of their sin. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, they also deserved God's wrath because of their sin. Pharaoh, he killed Israelites' people and put them into slavery, killing their children. God is wrathful and he's rightly wrathful because he's good. So this is, this is where we are. I have a, a visual lady that my nephew helped me to come. This is where we are as soon as you were born. You're dead. You're over here. You're worthy of God's wrath. You can suffer your whole life with disease, failure in your family, and everything, and you would not quench the, the wrath of the Lord in your life, and you're still worthy to go to hell. And we're hopelessly, and we're dead in this. And this is, this is sad news. Most of the world is right here, right now. We are dead. You were dead in the captivity of sin. If you, I know in my life, I, growing up, uh, I was kind of good at two shoes, so I felt like I did what was right. And so I didn't really feel like I needed God's grace. And if you made me think that right now, I'm going to take a moment to remember. Think about maybe the worst thing you've ever done, or the worst time of life, or how you treated your, your family this last week. We are all sinners, and we are all deserving of it. We aren't left. After this, of words comes one of the most life-giving statements in all the New Testament. <coughs> but God, but God, being rich in mercy because of His great love in which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions and in our trespasses, He made us a lot together with Christ. And hallelujah! That's good stuff! We, because of God, it says, but God. So God takes this initiative, and because of He is merciful, because of God's character, because who He is, even though we've offended Him, He decides to be merciful. And He is blunt rich in mercy, because of his great love that he loved us, even when we were dead, his enemies. I have a hard time loving those who do good to me. And, um, and he's loving his enemies. Worthless 
man. And we have been made alive with Christ. So we were there. And now we are made alive. We have transitioned from a place of wrath to a place of grace. It says, by grace, you have been saved, in the very next line. The enemy, the wretched sinner, receives an immense portion of mercy that is passed from judgment to life. So that's pretty good. We're dead, we're made alive. And it gets even better as we continue to read. And not only are we made alive, we're not like Soviet Russia where it's like, you get to live, we we'll put you in a little box. Yeah. Enjoy your life. No, no. Uh, and raised up with him. <coughs> we are raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We are raised up. When we die, we will be raised up with God and we will be given glorified bodies where we will not sin anymore. Where Christ will be with us. He will wipe away the tears in our eyes. And we will be healed. And then this next part, this next part I found really confusing. And he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why are we seated with Christ? How does that even work? It, the way the wording says, it seems like it's now. Now we are seated with Christ. And so I did some digging into this. And if, if you do flip back to Ephesians 1, 19, or just 18, Paul is praying for the Ephesians that they would be filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. Having their eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope which he is called. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance of all the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us to believe according to the work of his great might he worked in Christ? When he raised them up from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but the one to come and put all things under his feet yeah. and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ, the key word is with Christ. Christ died and he was raised by the Father and he was seated in heaven by the Father. And in the same way, we are with Christ. We are with Him. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we have been united with Him in His death, in the death of this, we shall certainly be united with Him in life. So we, we are to die to our sins. In baptism, we die. It's a symbolic of us dying to our sins. And we are raised up with Christ. And we are also seated and given a small measure of authority in this life that will be even greater when we die and we reign in the millennial kingdom. And it later talks in Ephesians about our struggles not against flesh and blood, but against powers in the heavens and against evil dominion. So, 
believe that's talking about we are given a measure of authority in Christ to wage war in the spiritual realm. Um, yeah, but that's just to explain that if you're interested in that. We'll keep going, talking about how amazing this is. We're, we're raised up and we're, we're seated with Him. And that's great. And then it says, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace. It can't be measured. Like the sand on the seashore, it can't be measured. And the riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What He has planned for us is great. Now if you think about this, Creator God, how many days did it take for Him to create the entire universe? Six days. He spoke and it happened. And we see the stars and then all their glory. And that same God who created the entire universe says, I am going to heaven and I am going to prepare a place for you. It's going to be fantastic. We don't see it now, but what He's planned and prepared for us is going to be fantastic. <clears throat> this is great news. We who were dead, deserving of wrath, in Christ we've been made alive, and more than just being made alive, we have been raised with Christ. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've been raised with Christ. We've taken this glorious transition. This transition from here to here is worth it. Anything that you would give up is worth receiving this from being there to there. Fire to glory. This transition is illustrated well even in the Old Testament. This isn't just a New Testament concept. Um, are you guys familiar with Mephibosheth? I'll give a kid five cents if you can say that. Mephibosheth. That's a so if you're unfamiliar with Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, David's enemy. Now King David was anointed king after Saul because Saul had disobeyed the Lord. And if you read in the scriptures, Saul has all out hate for David and he's trying to kill him, so he's running away from him. Saul promises David, I will give you my daughter in marriage, but then Saul gives his daughter to someone else. That was a thing. But as the story goes, Saul dies. And then there's this battle between Saul's household and David's household. Who will be the king of Israel? So they're enemies. <coughs> but David loved Jonathan, his best friend. And he says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show in kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, is there not someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son, Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. The king just said, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Loth Devon. And King David said to him, brought him from the house of Machir. He brought him, the son of Amiel. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David. And he fell on his face and he paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth! And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land 
of Saul your father. And you shall eat at my table always. And he paid him homage and said, What is your servant that you show your daughter for a dead dog as I? Mephibosheth was David's enemy. If you think about how kingdoms work, maybe he could have tried overthrowing the throne. He was crippled in both feet. Maybe he looked really weird. But because God had shown David so much kindness, and because he loved Jonathan, he brought Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth was crippled. He couldn't even come to him. Like us, we're unable to just come to God. He's broad, and he says, I won't kill you. And more than that, I'll meet in my view. And it's, it's beautiful. And it's by grace. This is a glorious transition, but you don't just, you don't just get, like, it's a free gift, but you don't get to be made alive and raised to life apart from faith. Because you come to church, you don't get to be raised with Christ. Because you share the gospel as you read it in the Bible, you don't, you're not raised with Christ. You can pray for your grandchildren every day, but if you do not have faith and belief in Christ Jesus and not repented from your sins, you are still over here. And so it says, by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God. Jesus came into the world, God came into the world, and he came as baby. He humbly came with me. And he lived his life perfectly without sin. And he, when he was around 30, he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him. And he went about the countryside preaching the gospel. It says, the kingdom of God is now. Repent of your sins. If you want to read that, you can go to Mark 1.14. And what did Jesus say? He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You must believe and follow Christ. And Romans 10 is this insurance. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you want this reality to be true in your life, turn away from your idols. Give up your greed, your selfishness, and your pride before the Lord and come humbly before Him and ask for mercy. It's not by the things you do, it's by the mercy of God. Believe in Him and His word. If you are interested about this transition, this saving, uh, hopefully you can talk to anybody else here. And uh, you can talk to the deacons. Uh, can the deacons raise their hands? Or the they should know the gospel. If they don't, <laughs> then send them to somebody who gets back. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And this is not by words. And in scripture, it talks often that it's not by words because that's the way humans seem to think that they can get to God, is by words. That's why all the other religions are like this. It's not. It's by grace and mercy. And if we think about this, you would think that Christian people would be the humblest people on the face of the earth. Because we know that we were there. And not by our own doing, we're up there. We still struggle with pride. 
and we struggle with pride, well, this is one big thing. That because when we come to Christ, we start, our, our lives do start to change. We start to, like, we're created for good works, and the Spirit is just in us, and we start doing good works. So we, we naturally have this pride. We need to acknowledge our sin. That's the biggest thing. Jesus told the parable of, of a Pharisee and a tax collector. Think about who you are in the story. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. This is Luke 18. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, who was a preacher of the day, and the other, a tax collector, who was a scum of the day, and they betrayed the people. The Pharisee, standing by himself, he prayed thus, God, I thank you. So he thanked God. He said, thank you that I am not a this tax collector. I thank you that I'm not like other men. <coughs> Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even fast. I fast twice a week. Yeah. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, wouldn't even look his eye as tough. Be his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the other one who humbles himself will be himself. Know that we're sinners, and we are still sinners. We will die if it's not for God's continual grace in our life and mercy. So, we're saved by faith, saved by faith in Christ. That doesn't mean that we have an excuse not to do anything good in life. It doesn't mean that we don't die. It doesn't mean that we don't fast. It says, Further on, I'm going to pass it. It's not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God before prepared beforehand that we should walk. So we are God's workmanship. We've been over this. God has created this life in us. We are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus, but we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's God's desire for our life, that we abound in good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. I love hearing stories of people going beyond the act of duty. I heard one recently of this, this person who had, they, they were 80 years old. And they accepted five kids, foster kids, into their home. So that would be why. Mm -hmm. Then they're on their second batch of five kids. Into their home. So they weren't even Christian. We're created for good works. So, so that's the message today in the scriptures. But what do we what do we do about it? We're supposed to maybe like we're supposed to think that we're sinners. And, but I I have maybe you've tried this too. I've tried to put myself in the sin, in the sinner category, but I still see my good deeds and like I don't actually I actually don't think I'm that bad. 
even though I know that I, the scriptures say that I am that. So what do we do about that? First we think and we pray. Because it is God who works his salvation in our hearts. It's God who convicts us of our sins that we can even know that we're sinners in the first place. So we're gonna pray today that God will show us by his spirit that we're sinners. And we're going to pray. We're going to meditate on it. Uh, before we pray, this is the thesis statement. This is when you're in Dairy Queen and the person asks you, hey, what was the sermon on today? This is what the sermon was on. Sound great? That's a simple answer. But the more complicated answer, we are dead, but by grace we have been made alive. And we have promise of incredible, immeasurable glories. This is an act of grace that is secured through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe. I guess another thing that's faith, faith is belief. It's without trust in this chair, I will sit on it. That's good. We are not saved by words, but we are created to God. So in that, I will uh, open us up in prayer as we bow your hands and we will seek the Lord. Dear Lord, Jesus, thank you for this grace. Thank you for blessing us with all your enemies. I pray that you would Help us understand your grace, that we can praise you, that we would humble ourselves before you, so we cannot praise you or humble ourselves on the I pray that this gospel story would become so true in our life that it would give us so much praise for you, that we would live a changed life, and that our works would abound and we glorified our Pray that we work this by the Spirit, by your Spirit. We do all the